Well, good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad that you could join us for this week's message. I've got a great message about increasing in our faith. But before we get to that, can you do me a favor? Can you like this uh, this YouTube video so we can extend our reach and also send a link of this video to as many people as you know. Let's get as many people connected to our church and to hear the gospel message. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. Good morning, Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us this week for our online service. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark's Gospel, the 21st verse. We're going to talk about the continuing account in the Gospel of Mark, where Mark is trying to show that Jesus has authority over all things. So we've already encountered Jesus and the storm as he was in the boat, right? And he spoke peace to the storm and it was still. And then we've, we've encountered Jesus uh, engaging a demonic man. And he basically casts the demon out of that man, goes into a herd of pigs. The man is miraculously healed, transformed, delivered, restored back to perfect health. So we see Jesus in, in control over nature. We see Jesus in control over the spiritual forces of darkness. They are no match for him. But when we come, in this account, uh, come upon this account in Mark's gospel, we see that uh, the, the stakes are even higher. Uh, a woman who's been sick for 12 years encounters Jesus, and then ultimately death encounters Jesus. Jesus has to wrestle with a child that is dead. And what Mark is trying to do, again, is to show to the Greco-Roman mind that was all about power, that Jesus is more powerful than anything or anyone or any institution or any army or any political regime you could ever encounter. He is the Son of God. No, no person, nothing on this earth is a match for Jesus. So let's look at this section of scripture and we're gonna talk about it. Now, as we talk about it, this is helpful to me. Anytime I read the scriptures, um, anytime I read history, is I try to put myself in this position and go, what would you have done if you would have faced this situation or this circumstance, because it helps challenge me, it helps challenge you, uh, in particular, as to what, how much faith do you have? How much faith do you have that Jesus can really bring about a breakthrough in an absolutely impossible situation? What would you have done? What would I have done? What would have, what, what, what would have uh, been your response in this situation. So let's let's take a look at the scripture here. This is in Mark's gospel, the fifth chapter. We're going to read verse 21 to 24. When Jesus again had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she will be healed and live. Can we pray? Father God, I thank you for your word. Your word challenges us in this section of scripture. 
who do you think Jesus is? And how much faith do you really have in him? And how much do you really believe that he's able to do uh, the impossible? So God, I pray, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us in your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see Jesus coming back to the other side of the lake. And so he's gone into the, the, the Gentile region, right? The unclean Gentile region. And then he's moved back into the Jewish region. Well, how do we know he's back in the Jewish region? Because immediately he encounters a synagogue ruler indicating the presence of Jewish synagogues. And what's interesting is this synagogue ruler reaches over to Jesus and says, listen, my daughter's dying. Can you please come put your hands on her so she'll be healed? So at this time, this little, little child is, and we find out she's 12 years old, is, is alive, but desperately sick. And so he needs a touch from Jesus, right? The, the synagogue ruler is saying, Jesus, please come, touch my daughter. And it's interesting that this indicates that there were Jewish leaders who were believers in Jesus or followers of Jesus. In other words, yes, in many sections of the gospel, you see the Jewish religious leaders rejecting Jesus. But in this case, you had somebody who was at the highest strata of society in the Jewish world at that time, who was reaching out to Jesus and asking for healing. So, so as Jesus is contemplating this, immediately a crowd arises and surrounds him. And so now he's delayed. He can't go to Jairus' daughter. And so the plot thickens and we encounter a second scenario. Okay, So the scripture says this in Mark 5, 24 to 28. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. And instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. So you go from one desperate situation to another, right? So now Jesus is, is encountered by this crowd, separated from Jairus. So now his attention goes in a different direction. And this woman who has had an issue of blood for 12 years... And theologians will tell us most likely this was some sort of menstrual flow that never stopped and went on for 12 years. But it gets worse. She went to doctors. But instead of getting better, she got worse. And she spent everything she had. So it's a hopeless situation. And so she's coming up uh, upon Jesus and she is thinking, if I just touch his clothes, other translations would say, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed. So she's desperate, but she's like, hey, what do I have to lose? I'm going to, in faith, even if I can't talk to Jesus and tell him my need, I'm going to at least touch him. And so this woman is, well, in the Jewish mind, unclean, right? Is that she's, if, if you know anything about the Levitical law, and it talks about a woman who uh, has a period of uncleanness after a menstrual cycle, okay? Well, this went on for 12 years. So she is unclean in the sense that ceremonially she cannot approach the Lord. She is at a distance from God, um, at least physically. She's at a distance because of the Jewish system. So, so this woman has multiple issues. She, is, she spent all that she had, so she has no money. She's still desperately, desperately sick. And she is far from God, or at least in the religious system of the day. She is unclean. So she's got all kinds of issues. So as this, as this situation continues, the scripture says in Mark 5, 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? And so this woman is healed. This woman is restored, and yet the disciples are skeptical, right? Because Jesus says, listen, well, Jesus realizes power went out from him, and he says, who touched me? Now, Jesus knew who touched her. What he was trying to do is to evoke faith in the woman, but also he was trying to evoke faith in the disciples, okay? The woman passed the test. The disciples, once again, they failed the test. They're like, well, Jesus... 
How do you know, right? In other words, they responded with a rational answer. There's no way to know. There's all these people here. Who knows, right? So the woman had faith. The disciples were, well, they were a bit clueless. And the scripture says, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. And so you have the disciples that were kind of clueless and rational and missed the faith that they should have had that, hey, this Jesus who you had already seen <laughs> calm the storm and cast out a devil, guess what? He's at it again. His power is being manifest again. Believe. Well, they don't believe. They miss it. But the scripture tells us that the woman was overwhelmed with fear. The idea is awe. She had awe. She had reverence for Jesus. In other words, it was worshipful. It was reverential. She recognized that Jesus was everything that everyone was saying he was. And, and in fact, Jesus at the end says, go in peace. And the word there is, is in the Greek is comparable to the Hebrew shalom, which is wholeness, which is soundness, which is human flourishing. And so we see Jesus does a multitude of things for this woman. Well, obviously heals her, but also restores her to cleanliness, right? Ritually restores her to purity so she can approach the Lord. And not only that brings entire wholeness, brings shalom to her. So what Jesus was saying, go in peace. It wasn't just, hey, see you later. But it was, listen, go in shalom. Go in complete restoration and wholeness. Again, we see Jesus doing an incredible miracle. However, Jairus is standing there in the midst of all this, right? The crowd is approaching him. And, and, and the, crowd, the crowd is surrounding him. The crowd is separating him from Jesus, right? So now his hopes that Jesus would go and heal his daughter are, are fading, right? And now the scripture tells us in verse 35 that the situation gets even more dire for Jairus. Because in verse 35 it says, While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Okay, so if that was ever a deflating situation, there it is, right? It's like, pff, stop believing in Jesus. Stop reaching out to Jesus, right? Your situation has gone from being um, dire to completely hopeless. Your daughter is dead. Don't even continue. Stop pursuing Jesus about it. However, like the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus has incredible faith. The scripture says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. So Jesus is giving the synagogue ruler an opportunity to keep believing, to stand in faith, to expect a miracle, right? In other words, theologians will tell us that one, pot uh, one potential reason why the healing of Jairus' daughter didn't happen right away but the crowd interrupted and the woman with the issue of blood approached Jesus was to build Jairus's faith. So the question for me, the question of you, for you is, what would you have done, right? You ask Jesus for help. You ask him for a miracle. Now there's a delay because someone else inter, you know, imposes on Jesus and asks for help. So much so that the delay causes your loved one to die. Would you have kept believing? Would I have kept believing for a miracle from Jesus? And Jairus keeps believing. So, so this is very convicting what's going on for me and for you to be candid, right? So it says, don't be, Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when he had come to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing, wailing loudly. He went into them, went into them and said, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they all laughed at him. And he put them all out, took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. And they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to get, give her something 
to eat. <clears throat> so we see Jesus arriving. Jesus telling Jairus, don't be afraid, believe. And there's a commotion. There's a crowd there. There's mourning going on. Again, what you need to understand is in the Jewish world of that time, uh, when someone died, you had to stop what you're doing and mourn. And even if you were poor, um, you had to hire at least two mourners and, uh, and, and in the form of two flute players and one wailing woman. In other words, that was the bare minimum. So there were at least two flute players and one wailing woman, but we know there were more, right? And we know it was superficial mourning because once Jesus said, she's not, a, she's not dead, she's alive, they start laughing at him, right? So in other words, they were hardly mourning from the heart. It was a superficial mourning. And we see, of course, Jesus kicking them all out and laying his hands on this, well, actually just speaking to her and saying, little girl, get up and she walked around so she was raised from the dead it's an incredible miracle in other words this is an incredible moment because we see jesus overcoming nature overcoming demons overcoming sickness and overcoming death and so to the reader mark is trying to say what are you going to do with this guy right you're going to keep ignoring him you're going to keep pushing jesus to the margins of your life you're going to keep going on with your life as if he doesn't matter well guess what he matters who else speaks to storms and they're stilled? Who else speaks to demons and casts them out and sets, you know, sets the maniac free? Who else lays hands on sick people and they recover? Who else raises it? Is Caesar going to do that? Is your governor going to do that? Is the, is the Praetorian guard going to do that? Are, are centurions going to? No, no one's going to do that. In other words, this Jesus that we're proclaiming is the son of God. What are you going to do with him? And that leaves us with some questions for me and for you. Okay, this message is as much for me as it is for you, right? And, and, and there's a few questions I want to leave you with today. One is, what is your current level of faith? What would you have done in the situation if you were Jairus? What would you have done in the situation if you were the woman with the issue of blood? Would you have pressed through the crowd? With, would you have pressed through the obstacles to touch Jesus for that healing? Would you have kept believing if you were Jairus? If, after asking Jesus for healing and praying for days or weeks or months, after the delay, your loved one dies? Would you continue to believe that Jesus can raise from the dead? Again, I can't answer that question for you. You can't answer that question for me. But again, the disciples didn't have faith, right? Uh, but Jairus did, and the woman with the issue of blood did. And so, so it begs the question, how strong is our faith? And so to help you today, I'm just going to give you a few practical items uh, before I close uh, to help you with your faith, all right? Number one, do you have clarity in your beliefs? Okay, when I'm talking about clarity, it involves at least three dynamics. The first is the content of belief, right? You can't believe something that's vague. So if there is fog in your mind regarding the fact that prayer works, or a fog in your mind that Jesus heals, or a fog in your mind that God is sovereign and he's in charge over everything, right? If you don't have clarity in that, right? you are not going, it's, it's not going to impact your life, right? In other words, you, you will truly be, be impacted by uh, the principles of faith and prayer and believing for miracles and things like that. If, if it's not foggy, if you believe, yes, I really believe God heals. I really believe God saves. I really believe God raises from the dead. I really believe that God is sovereign. Right? I really believe that God is sovereign over America right now with all of its pitfalls and struggles and challenges in so many areas. I believe Jesus is in charge. You, you've got to be clear on that. In other words, to, to have your faith strengthened, right? your content. The second thing is how strong is your belief? Okay, let's say you believe that God heals. Are you 51, 49 on that? Are you 75, 25 on that? In other words, how strong is it? Is, is, is it kind of, I just barely believe or I strongly believe that God heals, okay? I believe that God heals. Now, if there's a situation in my future that I have to believe God, I'm trusting that I will believe that God heals because, well, God has healed me multiple times in my life. So that has developed confidence in my life. 
I've seen people healed of sickness. And so that develops confidence in my life. So in the same way with you, how strong is your belief, right? And, and third of all, how central is your belief, right? Okay, tulips or roses? Doesn't really matter for me, right? Cubs or Cardinals? Mm, I don't know. Michigan, Ohio State? Now I'm going to have to say, hey, <laughs> I'm pretty strong on Michigan is better than Ohio State in football, right? And that's all in fun. But again, what about the centrality of the fact that if, you know, the, the existence of God, the existence of Jesus, Jesus being the Son of God, Jesus being raised from the dead, right? My conversion, your conversion, right? Those things should be central to our lives, right? If we lose that, I know if I lost my relationship with Jesus, it would not be good for me. It's a central core belief. Yes, I love Michigan football. Yes, I love summer weather. Yes, I love any good beach. Yes, I think the guitar solos are the best portion of a song, maybe with the exception of a drum solo, right? But again, that's not central to who I am. I hope that what is central to who I am is Jesus, his lordship, his rule, his reign. Again, we're talking about how strong our faith is. We're talking about how we get clarity on our beliefs. How central is your walk with God? Is it just a hobby? Is it a bolt-on appendage? Is it something you can take or leave? Or is it everything to you? Again, I can't answer that question for you. You need to answer that question, okay? So as we're talking about our faith and how strong it is, uh, how can we increase our faith? How can we make our faith stronger. Remember what the disciples asked Jesus in the Gospels? Lord Jesus, increase our faith, right? A couple of ways we can do that. Number one, be brutally honest and intentional in assessing and strengthening your beliefs, right? In other words, how much of the Bible do you actually believe? How strongly do you actually believe that God answers prayer? How strongly do you believe that God still heals, right? And, and, and begin to Again, if you recognize that your belief is not strong, pray and ask God to increase your faith. Maybe find a book or books about people that God used to do great miracles. Let that increase your faith. Again, it begins with assessing where you at, right? But second of all, take yearly risks to increase your faith, right? Is that increasing your faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Okay? Take risks. You know, pray for the sick. Share the gospel with somebody. Believe God to bless you financially or believe God to bless you financially so you can bless someone else financially. In other words, get out of your comfort zone and believe God for something more than where you currently are, right? Here's a great statement from um, J.P. Moreland in his book, Kingdom Triangle. How much of my life in ministry last year required the existence of the Christian God to explain it? How much would have happened if God didn't exist? Or for your life, how much of your life, right, in ministry required the existence of God, right? Uh, that's a great question. How much of what I'm doing or you're doing is in our own strength and how much of it is in his strength, okay? So as we conclude this morning, the message is how strong is your faith, right? What does faith look like? How do we increase our faith? What would you have done if you were Jairus's, you know, if, if you were uh, Jairus? What, what would you have done if you were the woman in the issue of blood? And how can you increase your faith? And so I want to pray for all of us. I want to pray for me. I want to pray for all of us that lo the Lord would increase our faith so that we can be people that trust God and believe God no matter what. Because guess what? Other people in your lives, your family, your friends, need that encouraging faith because maybe they're going through something right now that they need you to encourage them and to be strong in our faith, to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might will be critical for their lives. So can we pray? Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. And God, I ask that for every single one of us, you would increase our faith, Father God. Help us to be a people that take risks for you, to step out in faith and believe God for healing, for salvation, for breakthroughs, Father, for change, for transformation, God. Help us to be a people that step out in faith to see you move. 
And Father God, just like Jairus, just like the woman with the issue of blood, let us be a people that are firmly convinced in our mind and heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask and think. I ask and I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, it was great to be with you. Be encouraged, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and I'll see you next week. Take care. <music>